So we're in the middle of this series called It's Quiet Time. And uh, last Sunday, I handed out a little green sheet of paper to you about how to have a quiet time, how to go about doing that. Maybe if you're here today and you missed last Sunday and you'd like a little bit of uh, help in that area, there's a sheet of green paper at the information table with a little bit of an outline to help you get started again. But this six-week series is about getting us back into a close relationship with God. For some of you, that's going to be a first-time experience. For many of us, it's an experience that kind of goes in waves for us, right? We do good at it for a while, and then we don't do so well again. And maybe you're in that dry space, and it's time to get back on the horse and get going in your quiet time with God again. And for some of us who are disciplined in this and who do it regularly and it's just a checklist that happens, maybe it's an opportunity to bring some freshness into your quiet time. And so we're hoping that this series meets everyone at a different place, just like God intended to meet each of you at the place that you're at, but he never intends to leave you there. He always moves you to where he wants you to be if we let him. And so last time we talked about an overview of this uh, series about doing quiet time. Today, what we'd like to look, about, uh, look at a little bit is prayer. Why we pray and some, how we pray. Now, when you came in today, I hope that you got one of these when you came in. Uh, there are extras here. Matt, he has some up front. This is a bookmark we'd love to give to you. It's just a, a, a kind of a, a structure for prayer that we're gonna, I'm going to share with you in just a minute. Put it in your Bible, put it in your journal, keep it close to you uh, in the book that you're reading for your devotions. Use it as a structure for prayer. We're going to go through this in just a minute. Uh, Real prayer is life-changing. It is. It's intended to be life-changing. William Carey, a very famous missionary, said this, prayer, secret, fervent, believing prayer lies at the root of all personal godliness. And here's the thing. If you don't want to change, you won't pray. If you pray, you will change. Write that down. I think that was good. (laughs) You won't change unless you pray. And if you don't pray, you won't change. You see, that personal relationship with God through prayer, this is not something we do standing on the outside. It's not impersonal. It's not our fathers and thou arts and all that kind of stuff. It's the Abba Father prayer that we heard about earlier this week with John's, at John's funeral. That personal relationship with God where you can call out to him, Dad. It's intimate. And when that happens... God comes inside of your heart, inside of your spirit, and you invite him into that space. Can you just imagine that your heart is like your house, and you open up the door, and you invite Jesus to come in through prayer, and when he comes in, he gets to go wherever he wants to. Some of us don't want to change because we don't want to invite Jesus into some of those places, right? It's okay, Jesus, you can come into the kitchen and the living room, but you're not allowed in the closet in the bedroom, please or in the basement. And what happens when you invite Jesus in and when you bring prayer into a personal space, God begins to shine the light of the gospel, the good news, on those dark spaces. And that's why sometimes we don't want to pray. Some of you have been in that space where you have done something or said something or you've been involved in something where you know that God might be upset with you or might take issue with you on that subject. And what happens? We stop praying because we don't want to let God into that space. Prayer changes things. Martin Luther said this about prayer. He said, I have so much business to get done. I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. Wow. John Wesley said this, God does nothing but in answer to prayer. And he went to back this up. He devoted two hours a day to that exercise of prayer. Now, for most of us, that's so intimidating that we would just say, nah, I I couldn't do that. Or we look at the people around us or the people that pray regularly and we watch them or we listen to them pray and we say, oh my goodness, I just couldn't do that. I mean, that is hard. What they do, I couldn't pray like that. 
And so what we choose to do is to not enter into prayer because we believe that we can't pray like those people do. Here's the thing. God meets you where you are on the journey and takes you to the place he wants you to take. I've said this before in some of my classes that we've had, and I've said it before on Sunday morning. It's worth repeating again. I wouldn't knock on your door tomorrow morning with a pair of running shoes and track shorts and a t-shirt in my hand and say, let's run a marathon. Besides, that'd be pretty creepy. You know, you know, it's Pastor Martin in my bedroom. What are you doing here? <laughs> no one would expect that you could actually run a marathon that morning. Even if I bought the best shoes and the best track suit or shoes or whatever the equipment was, no one would expect you to run a marathon tomorrow. No one expects you to pray two hours a day tomorrow if that's not your habit. But God wants to meet you where you are and take you on a journey to growing and increasing and expanding the depth of your prayer. So get to know some people who pray well. Watch them. Model them. Learn something about prayer. And that's what I hope that today is going to be about for you, that you'll be able to learn something about prayer. One of the things that I want to share with you today is that uh, sometimes we think that, that God in his sovereignty as king, as ruler of over all the universe, that it, prayer is not effective because he's got everything figured out. That there's no reason for me to pray because God's just going to do what God's going to do. And that if he's got it all figured out, why bother praying to begin with? right? Here's what I want you to know. Over and over and over again in the Bible, again and again, it says that God changed his mind because of the prayers of the people in the scriptures. That God is at work. He loves us so much. His love for us is so full that he is willing to work with us to see the future change. Moses went to, to uh, God. God says, I'm not going with you and the people into the promised land. They, they, uh, they want to worship this calf. They don't want to listen to me. They've seen all these miracles. They don't, wanna, uh, they don't have enough faith to believe that I can do it. And so he tells Moses, I'm staying here. You guys can go if you want to. I'm not going with you. And Moses gets on his knees and begs the Lord, Lord, please relent. We want you to come with us. And if there's anything that I can do, Moses says, I'll repent on behalf of the whole nation of Israel so that you'll come. And God changes his mind. When you pray, you influence the hand of God in the life of the people around you. Isn't that incredible that you get to do that? That you get to influence the course of events in history. When things are playing at the world stage, when you pray, you move God's hand. But it comes with a great deal of responsibility. Because if you can change history, change the course of events, because you could have prayed and you didn't, we now bear some responsibility for that. So prayer is so important. It's important to everything in your life. It's important for your kids. It's important for your grandkids. It's important in finding a job for healing, for uh, all the hurts that are going on in the world, injustices. They are moved. You move the hand of God at work in those things when you pray. That's how important this is. And if you know this much about prayer, then I beg you today to learn this much more and grow in your capacity to pray. Jesus, well, the good news here is that the disciples are in the same situation we are. The disciples had the same problem. They prayed all their life. They grew up praying. They were in the church in the synagogue praying. They saw people pray. And yet, as they watched Jesus pray... They needed him to teach them about prayer. Remember last Sunday, I told you that Jesus went off to pray by himself. He went and had quiet time with God. He found a special place, a quiet space, somewhere where no one would bother him, where he wouldn't be a bother to someone else. And that sacred space, usually for Jesus, was up on a mountain, up on a hill somewhere. 
And over and over again, if you've read the Bible passages from Luke chapter 1 through 6 that we've challenged you to read, there's a card that we handed out last Sunday. And if you didn't fill that out, we would encourage you to do that. The reading here is here on the card. And as you read into this week from Luke 7 through uh, to Luke 12, you'll see it again and again. Jesus goes off to pray. Jesus goes off to pray. And at first, the disciples are like, where did Jesus go? Where in the world did he head off to? And then they see him coming down from the mountain. And then they see him going up to the mountain. And then they see him coming down from the mountain. And over the course of time, they start to recognize this pattern in him. And they begin to realize that Jesus is praying to his heavenly father. And in chapter 11, which is in the reading section for this next coming week, this is what we hear. Chapter 11, verse 1. Once, Jesus was in a certain place praying. And as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples to pray. So we have this encounter where Jesus comes down from the mountain. He's engaged in a time of prayer. And the disciples said, look, my prayer life is really awful. Or they're thinking, there's something up with the way that you pray that I want to learn about. Have you ever been there? You ever been in that place where you're feeling like, okay, Lord, my prayer life seems like a grocery list. Or I just keep saying the same things over and over again. Or maybe you're one of those foxhole prayers. Oh, Lord, I got another speeding ticket. Lord, please make his pen run dry. <laughs> you know? Uh, or you're praying those emergency prayers and that's it. How do we do this thing called prayer? I said to you last time, and we heard from Elisa, she gave some material for my last sermon, and there's a course that I'm teaching called Communicating for Change. There's eight students in the course. They're all giving me material for this series. So Janice Bontius is on deck for this week, and what she did was beautiful. I love the way she did this. She turned the narrative, the story that I'm about to read to you into a first-hand experience. And we, if you ever do this when you're reading the Bible, it's, it just will open up your mind to what God might be saying to you. She put herself or wrote a narrative of what the disciples might be thinking as Jesus preached this to them or taught this to them. And she wrote it down as if they're thinking it in their heads and she's helping us to understand a little bit too about what was going on in the background. So if you're ever reading a passage of scripture and you get to the end of it, Go back and put yourself in the story. Become one of the disciples. Become one of the bystanders or standing in the crowd as you watch and you listen, as you hear what Jesus is saying or the, or the Bible is telling you about. It opens up your mind to what might happen. And so this is what she wrote. Jesus is always going off by himself. What is he doing so secretively? Most rabbis and teachers say their prayers out loud for all to hear. Not Jesus. He's always off somewhere, away from the crowds, away from the busyness. All, he's coming back now. Lord, teach us to pray. And then Jesus says this. A short prayer, he said. Nothing frilly or wordy. Straight to the point, so easy to remember. Jesus said, Father. Next. Uh, May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. Oh, I can do that. Even I can remember that one. Oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, he's explaining it, so just wait. Then... Teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door's locked for the night, and my family and I are in bed, I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. Why would I have company so late? What if they were to come and I had nothing to feed them? Sure, I, I guess I would have to plead with my neighbor. 
Oh, he might get upset with me now, but he'll probably forget about it in the morning. But I can't go back to bed without any food. I'm going to have to keep on knocking. Oh, it's persistence that Jesus is talking about. It's about banging on the door of heaven. See, what Jesus is trying to communicate to us is that prayer should be almost in its tone. Like it says here, your shameless persistence with banging on the door of heaven. If you have a need that is within God's will to achieve for you, if you have a desire of your heart and you are going to God in prayer, bang on the door of heaven. Jesus is telling this story saying, look, be persistent in your prayer. God wants prayers full of nerve, Amen. right? <laughs> Conviction about the belief that God is going to do something through that prayer. Here's something interesting to me. When I read all the teachings on Jesus and I read about the apostles when they prayed, never once do they say, if it's your will. We do that all the time, don't we? We say, if it's your will, God, please make that happen. They went into prayer rock solid believing that God was going to answer because it already was according to his will. If you don't know what God's will is, it's in here. Should I pray for somebody who's sick? I don't know. If it's your will, God, well, doesn't that sound stupid? If it's your will to heal somebody, it is God's will to heal somebody. God says, I want to heal people. Will God answer your prayer? That's not my business to judge God. What I know is that it's God's will for him to heal people. And that's what I should pray for. God, please heal so-and-so. If you use the doctors, heal them using the doctors. That would be wonderful. And believe it with the conviction that God could do it. Enter into your prayers, knowing God's will. Uh, saying uh, prayers like, God, we want you to free these people from their sin and from their life. God, we want to pray for salvation for so-and-so. Not if it is your will, because we know that is God's will. That is God's will. And that's how we're called to pray. With a conviction of the heart saying, it says it in there. So I should pray it. By the way, you don't have to pray that it's okay with God to lie because it's in here. You don't have to pray that you get away with not paying your taxes because you're supposed to pay your taxes. It's in here. When you pray, you don't have to pray for a Porsche because you may not need a Porsche. It may not be God's will for you to have one because it's not in here. God says, pray. Pray in my will for what you need. Do you need food, shelter, clothing? Absolutely. Pray for those things. If you're out of a job or you've got uh, a not enough food in the fridge, you need clothes for your kids, you need to pay for a car insurance so that you can actually go to work, pray that God would provide for that. Verse 9. And so I tell you, Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Be persistent in your prayers. Verse 11, another example. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your own children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If we ask for God's wisdom, if we ask for God's discernment, if we're asking for mercy and justice in the world, if we're asking for, for God to fill us and lead us and, and guide us, he, this is a promise right here that says he will give it to us. It's a promise to us. It's not even if it's will or it's not. He says, look, if you pray that way, I will give it to you, the Holy Spirit. But pray that way. So often we're, we're not so specific with, with God. We don't want to talk to him that way. We don't think we should. And yet we're called to, into a relationship that has his name 
bad. That's part of our vocabulary. The prayer God desires is bold and even shameless at its time in its approach to him. He desires prayer with nerve. All right, so how do we do that? So what we decided to do is to give you a little help, a structure, something to use in order to make that work. The Lord's Prayer in the Scriptures is a structure. It's a way to pray. It's a way to put words around some phrases that will help you in your prayers. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, in Matthew chapter 6, um, Jesus says, don't be like the Pharisees who stand up in public and repeat words without meaning. Haven't we done that to the Lord's Prayer sometimes? If you've said it at home at the dinner table a thousand times, if you've said it at church before or at funerals and you pray the Lord's Prayer, we repeat it as meaningless words. Don't do that. Use it as a structure. So, like this one. The first one here, take it out and have a look at it here. Use this as a structure. It says chat. Uh, Some, uh, you know, acronyms that are helpful, the the ACTS, A-C-T-S, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. Rick Warren uses one with the word pray. Um, uh, Very similar. This is just another uh, way to structure prayer. So, cheer God on for who he is. What fact about God makes you glad? God, your name is holy. What makes me glad about you is that you're holy and I'm not. I'm so glad that you're perfect, God. I am so glad that you created this beautiful day outside where I can sweat in May. Yeah. I am so glad for you, God, because you created my wife and my kids and you created doctors. And wow, I'm so, you are so awesome, God. And that's a prayer of adoration, right? Cheer God on for who he is. The second one, humble yourself before God. If Jesus took a tour of your heart, what would he find? Ooh. And that's a humbling prayer, right? It requires that you actually name some things. That It requires that you actually confess your sins before God. The Bible says uh, in uh, 1 John chapter 1, If we claim we have no sin... We're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Well, Lord, um, please, you know, shine your light of truth on my life. And Lord, uh, please don't look over here right now because you don't want to see that. God knows what's there. If we don't confess it to him, we're telling him he's a liar. God knows it's there already. He needs us to say it out loud, to confess it before him so that we might be forgiven. So that the Holy Spirit, the light of the Holy Spirit might shine upon us. He knows all of our sins already. Are we going to call God a liar and refuse to confess them? Another thing that we want to do is appreciate God for what he has done. What happened in your life today that you can thank God for? Uh, At this point in your prayers, just 20 things. What 20 things are you thankful for? Just name them, one after another after another. God, I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for these kind of things. Lord, you are so awesome. You provided thanks for this, and thanks for making that happen. Name them, 20 things. And then lastly, tell God your needs. This is where it's called a petition or God, I have these requests and then supplication. I have this friend, God, that you need to fix because their life is screwed up. <laughs> Praying for your friends and for your family. Pray for the things that are going on in your life. Be specific. Tell God exactly what they are. Pray to God for them. And then pray for other people. Pray for your family, your relatives, your friends. Pray for your pastor. Yay! Church workers, missionaries, and other people in in the kingdom work. Pray for the leaders. Come to the prayer breakfast in May. Pray for the leaders. Pray for people who you're witnessing to. And here's one. Pray for people who don't like you. And for people that you don't like. Yeah, you'll start to see something happen. Remember, when you pray, you you are co-heirs with Christ. You are co-workers with him in the future. For the future. Start praying for those people that you don't like. Start praying for those people who don't like you. 
and see God do something. So for those of you who have been doing prayer for a while, maybe this is a freshest way to do prayer, a freshening of your prayer life. I want you to imagine this. Being imaginative like a child, for instance, and using that in your prayer time. I'm going to give you just two examples. Um, maybe, uh, let's say you know someone that has a marriage that's unhealthy, okay? And you know that she is now sleeping around with someone else. Oh, boy. And you know that they need prayer, right? So use your imagination when you pray. When you pray, imagine that every time that she sees the man that she's with, not her husband, that she feels despair over that. And that she feels the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that she continues to feel that this isn't right and it's not working. And you can see her face and you can see the situation, right? Then you start praying and you say, every time she steps into a place with her husband, that you start praying and you say, God, every time she steps in that place, make her smile, make her remember her commitments. Father, I just pray that, that you would help them to just walk together and talk together and care for one another again. Or imagine that you are building a brick wall between that woman and the other man, literally a brick wall spiritually that they can't get past. Pray that way with some imagination. Why? Because when you can visualize it and see it, you begin to get closer and closer to God's will for it. Pray, believing that God will answer. Here's another one. Moms and dads, grandparents, pray with your kids. Pray with your kids during the day. Let them pray at supper time and at bedtime. You will be amazed and laugh yourself silly at the things that they pray for because they have this childlike faith. But at night, here's what I want you to do, moms and dads, grandparents. I want you to go into their room when they're asleep, especially when they're teenagers because at that moment you don't want to strangle them. <laughs> it reminds you of when they were little. And put your hand on them. And imagine the light of Christ flowing through you. We believe that we are being blessed by God, and by being blessed by God, we're called to bless others. Yes? Amen? Amen. Yeah? God blesses us. We're called to bless others. Put your hand on your child and imagine the light of Christ flowing into your child, healing their hurts of that day, the emotional wounds that they went through. See, here's something that you should know. When a child is asleep, their natural barriers are relaxed. And you allow the work of the Holy Spirit into their hearts, their bodies, their minds when you pray for them. Isn't that fun? I hope that freshens your prayer life. That it gives you some structure as to what to do. And I want to end with this story. There was a father who took his two-year-old son shopping. And you can imagine uh, the struggle that it was when he decided that it was not something that he was interested in as a two-year-old. And two-year-olds have a habit of making themselves known when they don't like things. They scream and scream and scream and cry. And as they were walking through the mall and as they were walking through with this little screaming toddler in, uh, running around, the dad scooped up the little boy into his arms and just started to sing to him. Now, this man couldn't sing a tune if his life depended on it. He wasn't able to rhyme. And yet he began to sing this song to his child. I love you. I'm so glad you're my son. I'm so happy that you're part of my life. And he just kept singing this off-tune, non-rhyming song as they went from store to store, and this little guy began to quiet down. After about an hour of this, and the child was calm, and he kept singing this tune to him the whole way, they get to the car, unlock the door, pull over the buckles so that they can put him into the car seat, and the little guy looked at him and said, Daddy, sing it again. That's what it's like in a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father showers us with His love and tells us how much we care. He, he cares for us. And He wants to enter into that kind of relationship that when you get down on your knees, you are saying, sing it to me again, Lord. Tell me again. That's what it's like when you have a relationship with God through prayer. Lord, I know that today 
Some people are just staring at me with disbelief. I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. And there are others of us here today who are recognizing and remembering those moments, those sweet moments of prayer. And Lord, for us, whether we're on the front end or the back end, Lord, I pray that you would meet us, each of us, right where we, we are and move us forward on that journey of prayer. And we might be bold enough to ask for things in your name. And that we might see your hand at work and work with you to change the world that we know. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we uh, do our blessing, our final blessing and closing? And then we're going to sing one more song together. We're going to invite the prayer team to come up if you would like someone to pray with you. If you want some bold prayers, some nervy prayers made for you, I invite you to come up and ask God to pray into that situation. And for those of you who are here for the baptisms and the professions of faith, stick around with us. Have some coffee and cake. If you're a visitor, don't be shy. Hang around with us and uh, spend some time together after the service. Hear God's blessing upon you today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. Shine upon you with his blessing so that through you and through the power of the Holy Spirit, you might be a blessing to those around you. Amen.